Hi everyone, this is Mary Long with My Art Dish, and today we are talking with Lennon Del Sol, who is uh, an artist who I truly admire and am actually taking a class with right now and have learned so much in this class. It's just been a culmination of much other learning. So, Lennon, I'm so thrilled to have you here with me today to talk about your art. Uh, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for inviting me. Uh... I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, me too, because I've learned some about you and, and uh, from the class, I see how you are, the way that you really look at um, each part of the process of um, the painting, but also really understanding the uh, models. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited to learn more about that, how you think about your uh, background uh, backgrounds and how you think about your process of painting. And then um, I look forward to a little tour from uh, of your um, of your uh, studio. So I, I think we'll be we'll be having a good time today. Good, good. I hope I hope uh, the viewers find it informative and uh, enjoyable. Well, I'm sure I'm sure they will. So you know, let's just really get to the point. You know, tell me uh, how you got started to painting. Well. Uh, I've been drawing all my life, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I really, it was comic books that got me into, uh, into the whole art field. Uh, comics, but any kind of drawn or painted image, really, mm -hmm. I always felt that I wanted to do that. And so, uh, probably about 10 or 11, I, I thought, well, I want, to, I want to draw for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, and try to do it seriously. And uh, so I, I sort of did. Uh, didn't please my teachers or my parents, but I did do that. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I started off, I w went to the American Academy and uh, I uh, got a job drawing uh, some comic books uh, just before I left that school and uh, I did that for about, only for about a year and a half because like most things that you've always wanted to do or you always want it's not quite what you want when you have it and so uh, I started to draw storyboards uh, for advertising agencies uh, and uh, my then company was named uh, Phoenix Studio. Uh, and while I was doing that, I was, uh, I became a member uh, of the Palette and Chisel. Mm. And that really opened my eyes towards the idea of painting. Uh, mostly because that's really what everybody did there. They all painted. And uh, uh, not so many people drew. Uh, so I started there with pastels and with watercolor because uh, I didn't like the cleanup that I thought uh, oil painting would would incur. And I did that for ages until about uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 2005. That's when I, well, 2005? Maybe a little bit later is when I started uh, my friend Mary, uh, Mary Chan, she uh, gave me some oil paints and let me use some of her brushes and a, pa and a palette and said, here, paint, some, paint something in oil. I did, and I found that I really liked it. And I've been hooked on oil painting ever since. <laughs> so. and, and do you have uh, influences, uh, influencers for you um, in your painting? Uh, yes, I would say my painting definitely. Uh, I like the I like the ones everybody likes. I think you know uh, Sergeant Soroya, uh, Klimt, uh, Chile. Those uh, painters really I think they've really helped me and inspired me. Andrew Wyeth really inspired me. His father, uh, N. C. Wyeth. Uh, a lot of illustrators are inspirational to me as well. Bernie Fuchs, I, and I had the good fortune of actually seeing him do a presentation here in Chicago uh, 
wow. long, long time ago. It was wonderful. And uh, uh, but even before them, uh, and this again, because of the comic book fanboy that I am, uh, Frank Frazetta was a huge influence on me or in the idea of painting. Mm. I didn't think, uh, I mean, I liked the subject, I liked the way he painted uh, back then. It's, uh, and so it really got me excited about the idea of painting. But unfortunately, it also made me think that I probably would never be able to do it. <laughs> so, so faith, yeah. Pardon? Ye of little faith. Yes, <laughs> little faith, exactly. I need to have a little more self-confidence uh, when it comes to that. But uh, uh, painting from life uh, and uh, drawing from life also has given me boundless confidence uh, when it comes to drawing and painting things. So uh, I no longer feel like I'm not good enough to do things like that or I will never be able to do something. Uh, it takes work, hard work, and patience, but eventually you will get where you want to be, mm -hmm. uh, or close to where you want to be, which isn't bad, because ideally you never get where you want. Uh, and I think because of that, you won't uh, go through what I did with the uh, comic book, uh, drawing comics, where I got it once I was there, I didn't want it. <laughs> so, and and it sounds like you um, have gone through the different types of media. So, past, mm -hmm. with pastels and watercolor and oil, do you mm -hmm. still do all three? Do you think that's important to continue doing um, more than one? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, each uh, different media uh, they inform the other. Mm -hmm. and what you learn with watercolor, you'll apply to uh, oils or pastels, uh, what you learn uh, and vice versa. Uh, I think it's very important to do something something else. I think you get stuck in a rut with, or you're in danger mm -hmm. uh, of being stuck in a rut, a way of doing things, you have a way of doing things and you only do that because it works. I mean, each time each time I, uh, I uh, see a subject, I like to try uh, to approach it differently. Or uh, I, I have many different ways of starting a, a project. And, and how do you do that? Because, uh, pardon? And how do you do that? Oh, yeah. well, it's from failing a lot. Because <laughs> you try things, you try things, and sometimes they don't work. Yeah. But if they work, you know, you, you re remember what you did. That's a very important thing. But if they work, uh, you have that. That's something that you can put away for another situation like that. Or maybe it's a, something that you can put away if you, if you feel that, well, this is how I would usually do it. Mm -hmm. But I would like to try this way that I have tucked away in my back pocket. And you can use that that way. And it's good to have as many different ways as you can possibly have, because there are many, many different uh, uh, subjects. And so uh, it's, it's good to know or, uh, or to have an idea of what to do or how to approach uh, that subject in different ways. You should have a choice. Yeah, I really enjoyed, uh, you did a demo in class about wiping away rather than uh, and kind of drawing in uh, the the uh, block in, and I mm. thought it was really interesting, just a whole and, and a whole different way of approaching it. Well, that way is relates very very closely to uh, drawing with charcoal. Mm. Now, as you can see, then how that medium <laughs> applies to the other. You know, you uh, we wipe you would uh, you wipe away the lights with the uh, oils with charcoal you'd wipe away you know the lights uh the charcoal for the lights in that so it's a uh it's a that's a very good uh, example of crossover how one can influence the other 
You know, I had, uh, I started out my uh, painting in watercolors and could not get a good watercolor painting uh, for, you know, probably a foot, a stack of uh, watercolor paint. <laughs> but once I took the fundamentals class, and by that time, I think I may have started in oils, what I realized that I was learning from the watercolor was how the different types of pigments were interacting. Mm -hmm. And having that foundational kind of understanding of a, the difference between an earth or a stain or whatever, it, it really helped me understand how things went together, you know, and, and how they would, um, I guess, relate and, and uh, have an effect. And that then was also very helpful as I started thinking about pigments and moving on into the oils and uh, but having that fundamental understanding was was uh, critical um, in my in my learning, and mm -hmm. moved on. I've gone into more uh, you know mostly oils, but when I'm on vacation, other things. I'm using watercolor with gouache, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's those yes. are very different. But you know, for me, but I love that because I get a whole I get a different look. But I'm I'm now getting an understanding of making those paintings better paintings. Mm -hmm. yes. I appreciate what you're saying, yeah. Yes, and, and the thing is, you, because of the oils, I'm sure that you're using the, uh, the watercolors differently. Could, be, could even be why you're using gouache now, because, mm -hmm. of the, uh, because you're, uh, you are using opaque pigments with the oils. And, yeah, you and, may I, be using... and I can cover up mistakes. Well, that's, that was excellent. <laughs> that's what drew me to the oils. <laughs> I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, one of the things, um, as you know, we we've, we've talked a little bit, but I really haven't gotten you to describe what is your body of work. I know you do portraits, um, mm -hmm. other things. Oh well, my body of work it's mostly portraits and figures. Uh, I would, I'd like to. Uh, I, I like uh, the, I like subjects where I can uh, I can incorporate a figure. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, I think a uh, figure in a background of the imagination or a background uh, of the type that appeals to me. Uh, again, I think mostly because of my comic book uh, uh, past, I like things to be a little fantastical. And so I know it's probably not so popular, <laughs> and uh, but that's what I like to do. <laughs> and so and talk about your backgrounds. We've had some interesting ones that actually I I enjoyed very much to paint. So how do you think about a background? Oh well, it's uh, a lot of times it's uh, I like to create a story. Uh, based on what it is that I'm seeing. Uh, I like to uh, look and imagine uh, my subject in a particular situation. Now, why are they sitting there? I mean, and I say sitting there because usually <laughs> subjects, they tend to sit a lot because uh, it's more comfortable for them. But why are they sitting there? Why are they dressed that way? Uh, why are... Uh, why or what are they thinking uh, at that time? Uh, and what are just what is the situation? I come up with a scenario, and that usually gives me the idea of what I should put in the background. And uh, then, uh, as you'll appreciate uh, from the fundamentals, you you have to create you create a, an idea of space and of design. Uh, you, you think of the colors that would that would go well there, and how to incorporate that back the your figure into that background. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find it all starts with a story, uh, a story that your subject has inspired, and it doesn't have to be a complicated one at all. It can be as simple as uh, oh, that person looks like they're sitting at a bus stop. Mm -hmm. I wonder what they're reading about. Are they happy? Well, maybe a person looks happy. So, before you know it, you put a bust up there that uh, 
And uh, again, it doesn't have to be complicated or it can be very complicated. Mm -hmm. So the figure can be large within the, uh, the painting or, or very small. Mm -hmm. So it, it, but the idea of that for me is what uh, that's that narrative idea is very important. And, and how do you uh, approach a painting with the sense of multiple hours and maybe more than one sitting? Okay, well, that, uh, the most important thing, I think, is to get your, uh, get your, your intention. You know, you've made up your story and uh, you've blocked in everything that you need to block in so that you have a, so, uh, a foundation for the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, when you oil out a painting, it's very much like working on, on it, uh, like you were working on it before. It's a nice, it gives you a nice um, client surface and you can do a lot of the things uh, that you, uh, it's just like working on it the first day. So, so the oiling out happens uh, second, the second sitting. So, mm -hmm. the second sitting, yeah, you, you should oil out because uh, it's, uh, it will give the uh, it's the uh, it will give the previous oxidizing layer something to feast off. Mm -hmm. uh, besides the oil that's in the paint that you're applying, uh -huh. and also your brush strokes will be much more fluid. Mm -hmm. But you don't put too much uh, linseed oil down, but uh, you put a, you just put the slightest glistening of linseed. On the uh, on on the surface, and it'll be a very nice surface to work on. And and then from there, um, once you're once you've oiled out, then you begin really getting to the detail. Uh, the detail, or at least, uh, although I think uh, not so much the detail, but you're getting back, you're getting reacquainted with mm. what it is that you were doing. Uh, you uh, start to, you look, especially if you have your subject in front of you, you look and you see the differences. Um, maybe uh, the, because uh, you, you've done your best to get back in the same position and get your model back in the same position. So what are the differences? Are the differences in light? Are things better uh, today than they were before? Mm -hmm. You know, you make your judgment with that. But also, am I, is my drawing was it off? Did I leave? Did I leave my drawing at an uh, what I call an ugly stage, you know, or or an in between stage? I mean, you try to get those stages as pretty as possible, but they're still not, you know, tip top. So you see what changes there are. You make those changes. Uh, uh, you describe them and you make the changes uh, uh, right away and then you proceed onward. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have, that's a very important step to make those little corrections and little tweaks in the very beginning, mm -hmm. uh, just so you have something uh, again to build on that's a little more substantial because you, you have to get to know your painting again. Uh, so that's uh, that's a step that I wouldn't overlook. Mm -hmm. and, and go ahead. Oh no, no, you go ahead. You know, I I was thinking about um, something you just said um, about uh, the lightness of the linseed oil. But one of the things I've really appreciated about you, I think uh, I I don't know that I've had other teachers really spend time on the. Uh, brush strokes themselves. You have such a light brush stroke when you're getting to that. Well, I don't know when you start exactly the lightest brush strokes, but you have very intentional brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I do. Uh, and, and thank you for noticing because uh, really it took a long time uh, for me to get that. I did uh, have a teacher uh, who's one of, uh, uh, well, we have a couple of teachers, uh, visiting artists that uh, mm -hmm. are also big, uh, big influences for me. Uh, 
Dave, David LaFell is one and Stephen Assail is the other. Mm. And uh, David LaFell is known uh, far and wide for his brush strokes and uh, the, the beauty of them, uh, quality of them. And he, uh, uh, he explained to us that it took him ages to, to get to the point where he, he was making things that could be called brush strokes. Uh, he said, they all come. You just have to be patient, they'll come. And uh, because we all think, well, we're making brush strokes now. And so, uh, because we're stroking on the, the canvas and we're making brush strokes. But uh, he, the way he described it, it was a completely different thing. Mm. And uh, so I tried my best to cultivate a light touch uh, and try to get to know my brush, uh, try to have it help me more than, uh, uh, more than anything else. Uh, and set, you'll hear me t say this when I talk about watercolor too. And I mean, these uh, tools that we have, uh, we still have them. Mm -hmm. We still use brushes. Uh, they, their technology haven't, really hasn't changed. It's because they work and they work well for us. And I think if you can develop a, and this will sound sort of stupid, but if you develop a, uh, I don't mind. It's <laughs> you for us. With that brush, you get to know it. You get, it only wants to do its best for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll let that, what mm -hmm. you'll find as you do more with your brush. And as you try, as you uh, thinking consciously of making brush rocks, mm -hmm. you'll find that a lot of what you intend to do, the brush is helping you do that. So, uh, but you have to think about making brush strokes. Mm -hmm. And it can be general as that, brush strokes, not fine brush strokes, not nice brush strokes, but brush strokes. Mm -hmm. And if you want a light touch with a, with a brush, think of, I want to develop a light touch with a brush and you'll, you'll have it. It may take time, but you'll get it. And that will pay a great dividend later, you know, if you're using charcoal or pastel, you'll get that same sort of uh, hand feel and tool feel with, uh, with those media too, because everything is interconnected. Well, I certainly have appreciated that and have been uh, working on it myself and trying to be much more intentional Good. Uh, with that. But you know, just because you have this uh, relationship with brushes, how do you clean them? <laughs> well, now I try to clean them very well now that they're my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, I'll first I'll rinse off the uh, the paint uh, with the uh, mineral spirits, and I don't use mineral spirits while I'm painting. Really, I intend to wipe the brush, and if the brush gets really clogged, then I'll use mineral spirits while I'm painting. But I'll make sure it's very dry. Uh, but when I, uh, I'm done for that. Uh, rinse off the brushes with the mineral spirits, uh, dry them, mm -hmm. and I will uh, 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 put some, uh, get some soap, uh, uh, really get the soap well into the ferrule, press down. My brushes will take that. And uh, then I'll rinse them, and I'll do that as often as I need to until everything comes out appears to be clean do you have any and, secret tools for cleaning i wish <laughs> i wish i had some there is, uh there's what, a uh, pardon was it you that that used the tennis ball oh that's right it was me yes that is a secret tool oh, sorry and it's a <laughs> secret really uh and i'm glad of that because uh that was a tip that i got somewhere uh, I don't remember the person's name that wrote about it, but uh, they said that they used a half a tennis ball, which as soon as uh, I read that, I thought, 
it's so obvious. <laughs> it's such a great idea. And yes. it's a great size because it's not, it's small, but it's also the, uh, the circle, the half circle that you need. That's right. That, that carpet fits, it's as if it's your palm and yep. uh, fits in your palm perfectly. And uh, you can really smush the brush down uh, and you can do that for ages. You can get it, give it a very thorough cleaning like you always wanted to, <laughs> but we're never really, we're not always sure that your palms could take it. But with that tennis ball, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And your brushes, I think, will thank you for it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And especially when you have a good relationship with a brush, as you do. <laughs> well, they, they're your friends. You have to treat them well. After all, you put them away in a box <laughs> until you're ready to paint again. <laughs> so. Do you have um, any other advice for painters that uh, just... Um, or secrets that you uh, want to impart? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's not so much of a secret, but uh, I would advise if, you, if you're painting in an open studio, I'd advise uh, people to get some binoculars. Oh. Which I, I know it came from left field, I know, but uh, I would advise... Uh, just because you never know how close you'll be to the uh, to your subject, and also uh, binoculars are good for checking some things. Uh, when you're painting, uh, from where you are, uh, you don't often see everything, but you make you might make the uh, head large enough where you should there should be a little bit more that you see, or Sometimes you want to see how a particular part of the, of the face's anatomy fits into another place. And uh, there's a, uh, a thing that uh, occurs. Uh, I don't know if it's, a, I think it might be an Indian saying, uh, if you know a thing, you, you will see a thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so if you know what the anat what this, the particular anatomy of a nose is, and by seeing it closer, the next time you draw it, or even that time that you know you draw or paint it, you'll know it. So, uh, for instance, painting under natural light, the light changes, and as it changes, we start to see a little bit more. Uh, things are, start to see things uh, a little clearer. And, uh, but because you took a look close up, you know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And that will be for that person or for the next person. So you'll, so it's worthwhile to get a pair of binoculars, even though it does look a little funny <laughs> to see you, yeah. you know, to, uh, see a person with uh, binoculars like that. I, I totally appreciate that. I've realized that there are times that I have wished I could just see what happens with their eye. I can't tell which part is, um, or something else. You know, I just can't tell exactly where the connection is. Yes. And, and the thing is, it might be as simple as just checking the color, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because uh, eyes are very reflective. And, you know, when you're far back, everybody's eyes look really dark. But uh, you, when you uh, uh, just you just look and see what color the person's eyes are, and you can apply that, and your your painting is that has that much more life to it that makes uh, as a result of that. Yeah, and uh, but don't over as with everything else in life, don't overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just use it. Just use a little bit. Don't yeah. use it. Don't do it. Don't. Uh, just use it to check things. Don't use it to draw from. Yeah. Uh, draw for a, a distance, check the specifics and make the whatever changes that you need to make, but don't, it's too specific if you're using the binoculars and yeah. that's not a good way to start. Yeah. You know, I have a question for you and uh, it, this is also out of left field, but when, when there's somebody that for the first time is coming to one of the open uh, studios, what's, what's your advice for them to come to the open studio? How do they approach that? 
Oh, well, uh, well, the first time you go to an open studio, you'll probably be nervous. Uh, don't be. Uh, everybody is intent on their own work. So don't worry about, uh, about uh, you know, I said, oh, my work won't be good. You know, that shouldn't be anything that you're worried about. And uh, so you go in, you get a place to sit or to stand, to paint. And this is where uh, uh, just concentrating on that story really helps you. Uh, it helps take you away from your surroundings and focuses you on your painting. Uh, that's what you're there to do. And so, uh, and again, these are unfamiliar surroundings. Maybe that's where you want to stay. You don't want to be have, uh, have your attention diverted uh, by those surroundings. So let your picture take you where you need to go. Uh, so that's my, my advice is uh, don't worry what anybody else thinks about your work. Uh, they will are only worried about their work. And so you should follow suit and worry about your work. You know, uh, I was talking to uh, an artist uh, yesterday who said that she was going to the open studio because she wanted to be good enough to be in your class. And I said to her, oh, I've been in his class so I can go to open studio. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of get your point. <laughs> yeah, but, well, in, in, no one's going to judge you in the open studio. And I'm not going to judge you in my class either. So. <laughs> well, you'll have a new student in there next time. <laughs> so, you know, speaking of studios, not the one at the Pelt and Jizzle that we're referring to, but uh, would you like to give us a little tour of your studio? Uh, I will, but uh, it's sort of it's a little messy. So It's a working studio. <laughs> so, well, working, I don't know, but it's working. It's a studio. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to turn this. Yeah. Uh, and so you'll see, I have some. Oh, nice. Uh, on easels over here. And this is my. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at the. Uh, to see what, what you might be. Uh, this is my. This is my, uh, my model stand. And uh, what's uh, lighting? Pardon? What is your lighting? Oh, my lighting. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to step in the frame. Yep. Uh, uh, well, I have a few of, uh, of these. I have a few of these uh, of, of these lamps. They are uh, uh, by uh, temperature lamps with the uh, color and the uh, intensity is adjustable also and they're quite inexpensive they are they don't get too hot and they're quite bright so uh, I have several of those they're very they're very good uh, uh, lights I think nice yeah and uh, also I'm going to show you uh, I'm going to point you up into the ceiling okay uh, I have these fluorescents. These are um, high color uh, fluorescents. Uh, Philips, Philips made them. Uh, I think they still make them. Uh, I got them uh, because uh, for their, well, as I said, their high uh, color rendition. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I don't have north light in this studio to the other part. Is this your attic? Pardon? Is this an attic or a garage? No, it's a it's a it's a uh, storefront. I'll, I'll, I'm going to walk down here. Okay. And I have these. Uh, I have these windows that uh, close this off, mostly because. I don't want, uh, but I have a model here. I don't, I don't yeah. want uh, 
So it'll be a, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't know, street uh, <laughs> observation. Yeah. People looking through the windows. Uh, let's see. I have this. And, well, here's my, again, it's all a mess. Uh, you probably would like to see some paintings, but I don't really have uh, things set up on the web. Uh, and I don't know how helpful any of that was. I, I think it's great. And um, now that you're a little closer to the uh, to your iPad again, tell us again what kind of lighting it is. What are your oh. your uh, um, lights? Oh, uh, the uh, the uh, the modular lights, the lights, yeah. the small lights. Those are uh, um, I think GVM makes those. And uh, they are LED lights, 480 little LEDs. Uh -huh. And uh, they have, uh, you can control the color temperature from 2400 Kelvin to, I think, 6200 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And so it goes from uh, the, lower, the lower numbers are warmer, so a little more uh, reddish uh, light and they go up to uh, a bluer light mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's they're really a very good light you have one of those at the palette chisel also and uh, everybody rightly uh, loves those yeah great yeah. so uh, what's next for you for uh, uh, showing your paintings and exhibits or other events coming up well uh, I have one that's coming up next week that I have to get uh, ready for Mm -hmm. which is part, I'm going to say, it's part of the reason that things are so messy here. Uh, and uh, the uh, that's going to be the Summer Suite show. It's a joint show. There's going to be six artists participating uh, in a show uh, at the Palette and Chisel mm -hmm. uh, next Friday. And that's uh, said, it's, uh, I think it's uh, June the 7th. Uh -huh. so we have our opening. Okay. So, uh, to see some people there. I hope to see some people there. That's good. <laughs> yeah. It's usually yeah. quite well attended. And then uh, in July, uh, we'll have the first ever uh, start to finish student show at the Pat and Chisel. I'm really looking forward to that because uh, some uh, of the students are present students like yourself and some uh, students that I haven't, you know, whose work I, I know has progressed. Mm -hmm. I'd, like, I'd love to see it on a wall in, in that show. I'm looking forward to seeing that too. So uh, that's, a, that's a show I'm very excited about. Great. Well, Lennon, this has been just a, a great conversation and a delight. And I am so glad to get to know you a little better. I so oh. admire your work and you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much for spending the time today. And oh, well, I, it was my pleasure. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to sign us off. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for watching. <laughs>